On this day when it happened, my team simply raised a bird in the sky because our team was told that something was happening in front of them. They heard the movements of equipment and they made a plan to fly by to find out if the enemy was retreating somewhere quietly or something else. Or if it is moving, it is possible to detect some moving or stationary targets to destroy them at that moment. When we looked around and saw that everything was more or less quiet, that the movement was somewhere very far away, a command came from the commander of the neighboring convoy that some civilian vehicle was moving in our direction. We turned the view there, that is, to an intersection where we know the enemy is hiding, but where we have not yet been able to accurately identify him. He either alternated there from time to time or simply came and left. We decided to return for our parents. We went to pick up our parents because there was massive fighting going on there. We passed the checkpoint, they let us through, we drove further and there was a blown up bridge. And we stopped abruptly, asked how to get there, where to go. They told us that you must drive in a straight line, then you turn and then go across the field, and you will enter the highway after that. And then we see a black car going down, or trying to go down, and we can't figure out who it is. Because the military people know that there is an enemy and a military man will not go there. That is, unless they are civilians. That was the immediate thought. So they need to be stopped somehow. And in order to stop them, something had to be done. Give them some kind of signal that they turned in the wrong direction. There was a hope that they would turn right at the intersection to our positions. It would be much better than straight on, because straight on was the enemy, and there was a destroyed bridge. And on the right were my positions. Although there were some mines there, I would send a mobile response group, and we would already meet them, pick them up somehow. I was at the headquarters, at the command post, when we received information from our positions that the vehicle was moving in the direction of the uncontrolled territory, the one controlled by the Russian armed forces. So we raised the drone and tried to observe what was happening, who was going where, and how we could help the people in this situation. We saw the car go around our barricades, minefields, and later saw directly that the shelling of the car began. We were driving normally at first, and then we began to drive up to the intersection, and that's when the explosions began. I 
я спочатку. I first heard the shooting from the automatic weapons and machine guns. Then I heard the operation of the AGS-17 and watched as they were already shooting at the car. The first hit was, I don't know which arms that was, what it was, but it was on the right side in front of the car and it was in my direction. After that, a couple got out of the car and we saw that they were civilians and that they had started moving in the direction of our positions. There was some small bus stop on the right, but it was also destroyed. We thought at first to run there, to hide there, but everything around exploded. It flies from all sides and explodes in one place, then in another place, and that's all nearby. Prior to this, the Russians also set up remote mining, PTM-3 anti-tank mines, which respond to a change in the magnetic field around them and detonate, i.e. if, for example, a car drives by this mine, it will explode, or if someone walks past it, it can explode. So it causes damage with explosive action. Then there were cluster hurricanes, that is, a huge thing that flies at you and which at one moment opens, scattering up to a dozen pieces of small mines, which then disintegrate into a bunch of small fragments. And finally, the 122-millimeter rocket salvo system grad, which simply covers the plane. At that moment, absolutely everything was flying in that direction, as well as 122 caliber, and 152, and even 120 and 82 mortars. The enemy didn't spare anything. They worked with everything they had. After walking 50 to 60 meters, they decided to return to the car. We did not understand why they returned to the car and got into the car. And the car continued to be shelled. We were sitting in the car. We are trying to start the engine in order to leave from there. And then something flew back next to the car. We don't know what. Something, maybe some kind of reverse shells. And we had to leave the car quickly. After the shelling took place, a man was already wounded with the AGS. So they could no longer leave the spot. And they couldn't hide. They moved back. Or rather, I saw how the woman helped the man to move back in order to hide behind the trunk of the car from the enemy's side. I jump out from my side and shout, Andri, Andri, run from here. And I turn around and see that he's on the ground. After the husband was wounded, the wife tried to give him first aid. But according to the video, the nature of the injuries in my opinion, was severe. There was a lot of bleeding. After she was done providing medical aid, we tried to raise another drone that was closer to the position and directly use this drone to indicate to them the direction in which they needed to move. I saw that his head I saw that his head was injured, and I immediately began to bandage his head to get large towels. I didn't know how and what to do because I'm not a doctor. I didn't know what to do, right? How you act. I didn't realize that. And then I did it all and I said to him, just don't die. Please don't leave me. You mustn't die. Please don't leave. At first I thought that the injuries were light, and then I already saw a pool of blood on the asphalt. I understood that now there will be a very large loss of blood, and he simply won't survive, because in two or three hours he can bleed out completely. And I sit and I see that a quadrocopter has arrived. The second time, we flew as close as possible to them, as close as we could. We were 40, 50, maybe even 30, even 20 meters close. We descended to them to show that we are here. I tried to show them with a drone that we are Ukrainians, that they should follow me. 
I turn and just fall on my knees, and I just scream with the most agonizing cry. I didn't know who it was, our forces, or the enemy. We tried to indicate the route to a safe area where a caponier for military equipment had been dug before. It was a large ditch in which you could hide from the shelling, and since the enemy was striking from barrel artillery, the shelling would already be nearby so that they could hide. But the people couldn't understand our hints. We had to invent something more accessible to them so that they understood what to do and where to go. Since I was already flying it to the minimum amount of charge, 10%, when the drone is already shouting to you that I'm landing, put me down, I need to land immediately, pull me home. Although, in fact, at this moment, it's already starting to land itself. So it was necessary to take it away and recharge it. And by that time I recharged, I should have figured out some way to explain to them what's next. I was talking on the phone at that moment, and I managed to reach Andrei's brother. Therefore, the decision was made while the recharging of the drone was in progress, and the appropriate person, my drone operator, was engaged in this. I was thinking about what we could do at this time. And so I found a convenient way to write on a piece of paper with a marker. I took an ordinary piece of paper and I took out an ordinary black marker from the first aid kit and wrote the phrase, follow me, during this moment of recharging. came to me, the phrase, and that's how the drone just flew along with this paper attached, and we descended again to the maximum proximity. that I would lose consciousness, and I was on my knees, and I just screamed and begged, help, help, pick up at least my husband, please. But the woman didn't follow the quadcopter. She showed us with gestures that the man needed help, and that we needed to go down to him. But unfortunately, it wasn't possible. We could not get close to them, because the enemy's positions were at a distance of 30 meters, and it was very dangerous, since even though they saw that they were civilians, they still continued to fire. And when she saw us and she understood what we wanted, because she probably didn't immediately understand, because she was already kneeling down and she was praying, begging us, pointing at the man. But we understood it. We lowered the drone up and down to allegedly give an answer that yes, we got it. Yet still, she didn't understand what had to be done for their safety. And then the drone starts to descend lower, and I see that something is hanging on the drone, and I don't understand what it is. But then they lowered it a little bit, and I see that they attached the phrase, follow me, on paper. And I didn't know what to do, and how. And at that moment, I was talking on the phone with Andrei's brother. And I shouted to him, there's a drone, what should I do? I don't know what to do. And Andrei's brother says, go, Lira, go. This might be the only chance to save Andrei, because you just can't carry him yourself. She saw this phrase. She got it. 
and we began to lead them out. When the woman already understood that it was necessary to follow the drone, I tried to indicate to her that she should cross the road because I knew where there were mines and where there weren't. Then I tried to say, cross the road, so that she would cross the road from the enemy side, so that they didn't see her and she could move through the field. I tried to lead her to this field, but since she didn't get me and she started walking along the road, we started to lead her along the road at a low altitude, flew the drone 30 to 40 meters away from her and watched her go in the right direction. I got it, and I turn to Andri, and I see him losing consciousness. And I understand that I have to leave him now to get help. And I turned to him and screamed, I'll be back. I'm not leaving you. I, I'll come back for you. You're not alone. I just screamed, please stay alive. Please don't die. I'll be back soon. I'll run to our soldiers and they'll pick you up. And I'm running. It's all exploding from the left, from the right. And I see that at any moment, it can explode under my feet. But I kept running and the quadcopter flied with me. At some point, it flew a little far from me. I didn't know why it flew further, but I was afraid that it could leave me. We also watched what was happening behind. At that moment, we saw the enemy's group, which had come out before, went to the area of the car. They might have thought that something was there, or I don't know what. They slowly approached in a small tactical group of four or five men, where one of them was on the side, and four men moved under cover of fire towards the car. She was walking away from the car under constant fire. You could see it in the video. You could hear it too. And they fired at our positions, but we didn't fire back. We thought that they would help the man or take him off the field, but they waved at the girl instead. And she was very lucky that she didn't hear or see them. And then the quadcopter starts to come back closer to me, and I run, and there are big mines ahead. And the quadcopter is trying to show me something. It starts spinning, and I understand that it was telling me to bypass these mines, that they can be bypassed. At the moment when the woman approached the mines, we showed with the drone that she should bypass them. At a certain point, she understood it. She passed them and moved on. I was very scared, and I didn't know where I was going. I was following the quadcopter, but I didn't know where I was going or who I was going to.
Я її ввів до своїх позицій, до моменту. I led her to my position. Till a special person from headquarters could meet her and take her out of this hell. And then I turn around and start walking back. But a military man comes up and says, let's go, we'll help you. Now we need to go for a little run because there is a fight. And he says, we'll take you to a safe place first. But I said, no, I can't, I won't go. I can't leave Andri. I won't leave my husband. He's left there alone, how can I leave him? I won't leave him. And I started to turn around and go back, but the military men didn't let me do this. They said, can't you understand that if you come back now, you will stay with him there. They will take you both down. I saw how the Russians came out to the wounded man, and I didn't understand why, but they threw him off the road, into a ditch for equipment, into a pit. For some reason, they just threw him there. I was ready to even go back there myself. It didn't matter to me that it was all blowing up. I was ready to go back and I... to carry him on my back, to drag him, anything just to pick him up from there. The man had very little chance of survival, judging by the nature of his injuries which I saw from the quadcopter. No one told me that he was dead. They told me that he was just lying down. He was like a sieve, covered in shrapnel injuries, had a lot of bruises and hematomas. I didn't believe that this man could survive due to the nature of the injuries. And I saw that there was a lot of bleeding and there was nothing to provide first aid with. No tourniquets, nothing to stop the blood. I heard that it started to rain and I began to shiver. I looked around and realized that I was lying in some kind of a ditch. After a night in the trench, I came to my senses from the rain. I understood that I had to get out somehow. When I removed the bandage, the leg began to decrease in size. It was very tightly tied. It was very swollen. And when I removed the bandage, I realized that I had to try to step on my foot so I could walk. First, in the morning, the military men told me that they had taken him away and that he wasn't there. And then, after a while, they sent me a video. The connection was very bad. They sent me a video but the video didn't load at first. And then it finally opened, and I see Andri on the video, Andri. And the military behind the camera told him to say hello. And he says in the video, hello, my love, I'm alive. I was going to the positions of the Ukrainian military until I met a soldier. It took about 30 or 40 minutes, but I walked with stops because I felt a lot of pain. I stopped, sat on a blanket and rested. On the next day, a colleague from a nearby SQ drops a photo and asks, do you know who it is? I didn't understand at first, and then I realized that this is the man who was shot by the Russians, who had a lot of wounds, and I said, yeah, I recognize him. And they told me that he reached the point himself, he managed to leave, and I was filled with joy for this man, that he was so strong and was able to reach it himself and get out of there. I only knew part of the story of what the patient went through. As a rule, such a patient arrives to us with an ambulance and already with a specific problem that we must solve as doctors. Later, Ukrainian soldiers surrounded me and asked my last name. What are you doing here? I told them everything as it is, the truth. My name is Bogomaz and I was under enemy's fire. I left my car there and I don't have any ID on me. 
and they say, we saved your wife. Then my tears started flowing, and so on. I was just glad that my wife was alive, and that everything is fine with her. Then I relaxed, and blood started pouring from the wounds. Well, these are such interesting moments. This is probably a great example, a vivid example of the vitality of the Ukrainian people, which are simply impossible to destroy with pieces of metal that the Russians shoot at us. An absolutely peaceful civil population, people that receive these abundant gifts from the Russians. But nevertheless, we survive no matter what. When the full-scale invasion of Russia began on February 24, 2022, it was clear that the volunteer movement of Ukrainians became very active. Because, first of all, the capital of Ukraine was surrounded, and it was necessary to see the enemy. It was necessary to understand where they were coming from. And drones, civilian drones, they are very convenient to use and to perform a reconnaissance function, to see where the enemy is attacking from. And it's clear that the volunteers, the Ukrainians, started collecting money in buying drones of various sizes and modifications en masse. And then, the communication is also very important. And here we pass on a big thank you to the Starlink company and to Elon Musk for the fact that Ukraine was given access to satellite and internet communications and for the fact that today the communication enables our troops to be mobile and to be informed. And it not only helps us, it helps to save people, to notify in time about the help that's needed. Right now, almost all military headquarters, hospitals, and other important institutions that require communication are equipped with Starlink. So this is our, Ukraine's great advantage in this war because we have this very fast and high-quality communication. I think that my wife and I survived to tell this story to the whole world. Well done, well coordinated, 93rd Brigade Battalion Commander, Chief of Headquarters and Company Commander, who moved this quadcopter, all did a great job. I don't see anything special or heroic in what has happened. It's just a normal and right thing to do, to save someone's life. Стоят расстрелянные гражданские автомобили с донецкими номерами, выпотрошенные вещи. То есть просто, видимо, оккупанты вот стреляли в людей, а потом грабили, смотрели, что они с собой везут. Вот здесь пулевые отверстия в стеклах, очевидно, стреляли в людей, которые ехали, просто расстреляли. Ми отримали цей матеріал, 
ми зрозуміли, що це мусять побачити не тільки українці, а й наші стратегічні партнери, весь американський народ. Ми знаємо, що Росія вкладає в пропаганду, в цю брехню величезний ресурс, мільярди своїх коштів. Тому ця правда – це наш маленький вклад в боротьбу за справедливість. Для мене, як для журналіста, ці історії було найважче. Це те, щоб люди знову пережили все це, розповідаючи на камеру. Але це було необхідно для того, щоб світ побачив, що російська армія вбиває цивільне населення України. Сьогодні долг кожного українця, незалежно від політичних взглядів, кому що подобається, не подобається, делать, что он может для победы, в том числе не только на военном и экономическом фронтах, но и на информационном. Поэтому ну, я считал своим долгом поддержать замечательного, талантливого украинского режиссера и продюсера Любомира Левицкого в его прекрасном начинании, которое на самом деле является важным аспектом борьбы Украины на международно информационном фронте. Поэтому вот наш такой информационный хаймарс.